Take me out to California. Hi guys, here in the UK it is Childhood Bereavement Week and I am now a year on from the death of my husband Ross to brain cancer. I have two children, Brooke who is seven and Texas who is five. I am not expert on grief, but I thought that I would share our journey and some of the things that I have learned along the way. Number one, children grieve in exactly the same way that we do. They have the same feelings and all of the same stuff that we have, just without the filter. So they take the filter off, they don't have the social norms, they don't have the way they're supposed to be, they just grieve. And that can come in all different forms, but what I have noticed massively is that sometimes, particularly my older daughter, will articulate stuff about how she's feeling, and it's exactly the same as I'm feeling, only more honest. When we go to bed, often that's the time when the girls, at bedtime, that's the time the girls will really feel a sense of their grief and we'll often have troubles with bedtime because of that. Now that makes sense to me and it probably makes sense to you if you're going through grief as well. At bedtime, we have space to think and our minds wander and our minds feel that loss probably more than they do in the day when we're busy children feel exactly the same. So if you are going through this, then you might find that bedtimes can become something that can be challenging. And I know that we are really feeling that right now. Number two, honesty is key. Absolute honesty. And sometimes in that honesty, you have to say, I don't know the answer. You know, children want to believe that their parents are the oracle of everything, that they know everything. And sometimes there's a lesson in just saying, do you know what? I don't know. My girls will ask me so many different questions about so many aspects of their loss and, and how my husband died and death and the afterlife. And sometimes I have to go, girls, I, I don't know. And, and nobody does and there's no reason. And that can be frustrating, but the honesty is key. Anytime that I have ever tried to maybe cushion some of the blow, it backfires because kids are so smart. They're so smart and they need to see, they need to feel that honesty. And I said to the girls from the very beginning, from when we knew my husband had brain cancer, they were too young to really be told then, um, they were babies. And But when he had his second brain surgery, they were told, they were given the details, they were given, yes, it was a, a childish, um, a child's way, of, we explained it in a very child-friendly way, but it was honest, we didn't cushion the fact that he could die from that. And when he, when we knew that he was going to die, we told them. When we knew that he was going to die in a hospice, we told them. And when I came home and told them how he died, they wanted to know everything. And I was completely honest and I have been from the start. I think that they need that right now. And they need to ask all the questions they need to ask. But my honesty, in having that honesty, there's a sense of safety. They can trust mom. Mom's not going to lie. And even when I don't want to answer the questions, because sometimes I don't, I just have to be honest with them because it's what they need to hear in that moment. Number three, your children are going to ask questions you don't want to answer. Okay, I covered that in honesty, but they're really going to ask those questions. They're going to ask how that person died. They may want to know how they looked, what their skin looked like, how you knew they were going to be, how you knew they were dead. My girls have asked everything, what, what Ross did, what we did exactly after he died, how the nurses knew, how do we know somebody's dead, will he come back from the dead, can he... Was it their fault that he died? My youngest, who's five, has asked, was it that she played with dad too much? Some of these questions are going to be heartbreaking and you just have to be honest. And actually, when you're answering these questions, if you need to cry, cry, you know? Don't shelter them from your pain as well. It's important that they see all of that. 
and they will ask the most brutal questions and I find that it's often people around you that will struggle with that. So have those conversations with those that are going to be around the children. When we told the girls that Ross was going to die, I did a video which I'll link up after this where I explained what we had said to the children and I gave it to everybody around me because I wanted them to know what the girls might say. I knew that my oldest was going to say, have you heard the bad news, dad's going to die. And I knew that a lot of adults were going to struggle with that. So I wanted to prepare them for that. So have those conversations with people around you. If you know that your child is going to ask them what your partner, what your whoever's died, look like when they were dead, and you know that might freak people out, then you need to make sure they are armed with what you would like them to say to that. You know, my girls really have asked everything and they like to reiterate and go over the same questions a lot. Why did dad get cancer? How did he lose his hair? Was he scared? What is brain surgery? What do they do? My husband was cremated, so they will say, did they burn dad's body? These are ruthless questions for us adults with our adult minds, but when children are going through this, they need, they need you to answer those questions and you need to give them space to do that. Most recently, I found because they ask at bedtime, I've had to allocate a time earlier on because I said, you know, girls, this isn't really useful when you're about to go to sleep. So we've had to factor in those conversations and I go, look, free for all, ask anything you want. There's no judgment, ask me anything. And it allows them the floor to go, actually, you know, I was wondering if I'm a bad person because I can't really remember what dad looked like, which was a question that my five-year-old asked. Obviously, that's, it's heartbreaking that that's something that's been in her head, but it's better that she says that out loud. It's better that our children say those things than keep them in their heads. Number four, at times your children are going to be angry, really angry, and that anger will often be targeted at you you are their safe person. I have talked about this on here before, but both my girls have experienced this. And without divulging, you know, how they've dealt with that or, or you know, sharing exactly because it, it's personal to them, they have dealt with some anger. And sometimes children will say that they hate you and they wish you were dead. They wish that you died. They will say hurtful things. They will say they don't like things about their life. And sometimes it's it's kind of weird. It's almost like a shock. Like I'm in pain, so I'm gonna say the most painful thing to you, so you know I'm in pain. And if you aren't listening to that message, you know you can just interpret that as they're being naughty. And even when it's hard, because I'm not gonna pretend to you that that isn't in the moment when when children are in that anger, it's very hard to deal with. Because on the one hand, you're going that's not okay behavior on the other hand you're going i can hear that you are screaming out for a way to make sense of all of these emotions and these feelings that you're having and it's such a hard balance and i don't always get that right you know you're, you're trying to balance out being the parental disciplinarian and then on the other hand you just want you know you want to give them a cuddle and all of the things when they're in that um mist in the anger mist and they don't know how to deal with it I am finding that for me personally with my girls, I have to try lots of different tactics and the one thing will work one day and then it won't work the next. And sometimes you are just pulling your hair out because you don't know how to help. And I think what I'm learning is that consistency seems to be the key. I don't always get this right, believe me, but trying to have that consistency and reminding them that you're there no matter what. And even when they say hurtful things, that you won't you won't judge that, and that you understand that they're really they believe those things in that moment, but that you will always love them no matter what they say. And I think and hope I'm fairly confident that if we keep reiterating that to them, that as they come out of the other side of that grief and as they age and, and they grow up, that they will feel that sense of love and that consistency there. But it can be challenging, so be ready for that and don't take it personally. I don't take it personally when Brooke, particularly, who's older, says she hates me or says things like that. I, I don't. I'm not saying that on the wrong day. It doesn't sting a bit and it's flattening and it's hard. But I know that it's said from a place of frustration. You know, sometimes I'll, they'll scream, 
don't come near me, don't hug me from another room. And I know that that means please hug me, please find a way to hug me. And even when they're like, don't touch me or don't hug me and they, they're cross and they're angry, I can see that desperately they do want that. And I find ways, even if that's, you know, can I, could we hold hands? Could we, could I just stroke your hand? Could, maybe you could touch me or you touch my hand or, or whatever it is to try and let them feel connected. But maybe they're not ready for a cuddle yet, but they need something. And I can see that as a mom and, and it's so hard to get that balance right. But I want you to be prepared that they might be angry and it's not personal. They just don't know what to do with this explosion of emotions that they're feeling. Number five, just like us as adults, sometimes children suppress their emotions and their sadness because they don't want to look silly in front of everybody else. And I've learned particularly with my older daughter that she doesn't want to seem weird, you know? She doesn't want to be the odd one out and she doesn't want to cry at school or cry in front of other people. And she really feels that sense of um, not wanting to be different and we as adults feel that and it's something that I've had to address and something that I'm working on at the moment because often as adults we just get on with life because we kind of have to and that doesn't mean that we don't feel sad that doesn't mean that we don't want to cry sometimes and often if I am upset I wouldn't necessarily do that in front of the girls because if they're in a good space at that moment and I cry even if, even with the best will in the world, they will then feel sad. And that's kind of hard. But then on the other side, I want them to know that I'm feeling it too. And so I have to demonstrate that. And it's something that I'm working on at the moment because I want them to feel free to burst into tears in the middle of a supermarket if they need to do that. I don't want them to suppress that. Because they're at school most of the day, sometimes they will feel sad at school or they will feel that they've, you know, they've felt this overwhelm or something and they've bottled it up and they bottle it up and then they come out like a rocket out of school and then we have a, a difficult evening because they've suppressed all their emotions and they're not seeing that with me you know they don't see me burst into tears in a supermarket I'm not saying that I haven't done that but I'm not in that space now and it's not how I deal with things so in order for them to be able to do that then I'm actually actively trying to be openly more emotional in public which is such a weird thing because in all honesty I'm having to not fake it but force it because it's not natural to me either and I don't really feel the need to do it now in that way it's not often I'm not saying it's never but it's not often that now but I want them to feel free to do that so do appreciate that just like us that your children might not be able to express that and might feel a bit embarrassed that they're the different one, that their parent or their whoever has died, they might struggle to want to open up about that. It's something that we're working on. We are trying to find ways with the school as well to allow them an outlet. And I've also found that I've given them a book so when they get home it's their get it out book and they can write in it when they get home from school or at any point they're feeling that stress and that overwhelm and I've said to them girls you write anything you want in there you can write swear words in there you can write angry words you can write things that you never want me to see I will not read that unless you want me to what I find because my girls are younger they often use it as a way to tell me something they wouldn't say out loud so I will, um, they will often come up to me and ask me to look at it, which is fine, but I want them to have that space to say whatever they want freely without judgment. And, and sometimes I'll say to them, you know, when they're in that space, explain any word, even if it doesn't seem to make sense, just say the word, say a word or draw me something. Or for my girls, cause they see me talking on camera, I'm like, do you wanna go and sit and talk to the camera? And if you wanna show me, you can. And if you don't, we just delete it and it's fine, but you've got it out. That's the key is being able to just have an outlet of some kind. Number six, your children are going to feel unsafe. They have experienced something that other children probably won't and that will make them worry that everybody around them is going to get sick or die and that you're going to die especially if it's a if it's the other parent that has died it I find that my girls are worried that I'm going to die 
and they're smart enough to know that I can't promise that I won't die. I've spent quite a few um, nights justifying my own health and kind of going, look, I'm trying not to die. I, I'm, I don't really drink, I don't take drugs, I don't smoke. I'm not that risky. Um, I'm doing my best. I'm quite young. You know, I'm, I'm likely not to die, but of course I can't promise that to them. But there's this feeling of instability. And I'll find myself a lot of the time when I'm cuddling the girls saying, guys, you're safe. You're safe and I'm here. And I'll be here through it all. And yesterday my daughter sent me a message. She's got these, they've got these tablets, these kiddie con things. I sent me a, a text message that said, mom, um, sometimes I'm sad, sometimes I'm angry, sometimes I'm happy. All emotions are okay. And, um, and I just said, yes, they are. All emotions are okay and I'll be holding your hand through every single one of them. And that's all you can really offer in terms of the safety. You can't promise anything. And in the long run, I think it will teach our children to be more empathetic, to live in the now more and to really appreciate life. That's what I'm aiming for anyway. It hasn't been an easy journey so far. And the one thing that I've really tried to do with the girls is always talk about my husband and never make him a taboo subject, never make any question um, taboo. And also to recognize when they're just playing up because they're kids. And even sometimes when they bring up their grief or their sadness, it's sometimes they will do it as a way to get out of being in trouble for something normal. So they're not tidy in their bedroom, they'll burst into tears and say, I'm sad over dad. And, you know, they, it's their way of, and, and I'm not, it's not minimizing or saying that they're not feeling it at all, but sometimes it's just kids going, well, I know that I'll get mum to stop being cross at me. And in that moment, I will say, you weren't thinking about dad right now. And if dad was here, he'd tidy, tidy your bedroom. And I don't ever, I never allow it. So there's always space for them to talk about their dad. He's not a taboo subject. And if one of them wants to talk and the other one cries, I never say, right, we'll stop talking about it. I say, no, this person needs to, if you don't want to be around for that conversation, then you can go and play in the other room. But it's not their fault that you're sad. You're sad because sometimes they will say, well, they're making me feel sad. I say, no, you're sad because it's sad. You're not sad because they're talking about it. You're sad because the situation's sad. I have also given, we've got a jar in the house where the girls can write um, little notes about if they have a memory about their dad, they'll write it down and they can put it in there. And I constantly do it anyway. I will always say, oh, your dad liked that. Oh, your dad would have laughed at that. Oh, this was your dad's favorite song. I say that all the time. I say it naturally. It's not a forced thing because it's just what I think. I think about Ross a lot. He was such a huge, huge part of my everyday life, not just part of my life. He was my everyday. So... I can't help but do that. And I'm not gonna stop doing that because they do need to hear it. They also need to know that they can be happy and that's okay as well. That they never have to feel that they have to feel sad in some kind of sense of duty to feel sad because I don't show them that either. I say, look, your dad wanted you to be happy and live your life and do what you need to do. If you feel sad, that's fine. If you feel angry, that's fine. If you feel happy, that's fine. All of those things are fine. If you feel bored of talking about it, that's fine. None of these things are wrong. The only wrong thing is how you, in the way that you deal with it. So if you are angry and you punch your sister or you smash something up, which isn't where mine are at, but it can be for some children. And if that's how you deal with it, not acceptable. And there has to be boundaries in place. However, it's still not, it's still a really perfectly reasonable emotion to feel angry. And I've found actually with the anger side, sometimes physicalizing it helps or letting them punch a pillow or scream into a pillow. Sometimes that works. On other times it fuels it. So it's really hard. You've got to properly judge it. And the other side of it is, if you're going through this right now, especially if you are grieving yourself, just be kind to yourself because we are not gonna get this right 100% of the time. And right now I'm in the thick of it with the girls because they are a, a year, over a year on in their cycle of grief and it's a new stage for everybody. It's a new stage for me. It's that real deep level of acceptance that Ross isn't here and maybe everybody else isn't talking about it. Maybe there isn't the distractions that we had this time last year. The passage of the seasons reminds you that another year is here and we aren't going to be seen in with Ross 
and I think that is really difficult for everybody around and you have to be kind to yourself enough to know that you've never done this before. I've never done this before, you've never done this before and there are going to be times when we are just way off the mark but I think if we keep trying and we keep keep reminding our children how loved and safe they are that that will be the thing that sees them through in the long run. Thank you for listening and I hope that you got something from this and if you are going through this personally I'm sending you so much love and so much strength and even if you're not okay right now you will be just keep walking through it if you like what you have watched on this video then subscribe to the channel click the little bell to get some notifications and drop me a comment below so that i know that you have been here speak to you all soon peace take me out to california take